from the land of sky blue waters welcome to the soda pod isha jerome here and i'll be joined by seth topol momentarily and i thank you all for joining us wherever and whenever you are listening today on tap we have a great hoppy hour shout out to portage brewing it is amazing cannot wait to dive into it and share it with you all we also bringing on steph topel as we do here every single monday we will talk a little bit minnesota wild we'll talk about jesper wallstadt getting his second ever start in a much better situation in a much better look We'll talk a little bit about the Winnipeg loss, mostly just highlight how amazing Kirill looked in that one. And then we'll dive into a couple other wild topics, but mostly some NHL news here as well, including seven interesting deals that were signed this last month. Shout out to the Hockey News. They actually wrote a really awesome article, and we're going to pump it and highlight some of these guys that they mentioned from the article. Link to it will be in the description of this video on YouTube and in the podcast. Also, we have three other stories in the world of hockey that not a lot of people are talking about. Now, they are in niche markets, niche leagues as well. So there's a few NHL topics. We obviously got some wild topics, but first let's get to the hoppy hour. And as always, ladies and gentlemen, the hoppy hour is brought to you by our friends at Northland Vodka next week, April, I believe it's 14th. Next week, Mark Parrish and the crew at Northland will be at Total Wine at their Maple Grove location doing signings for their bottles. You bring in a jersey, I'm sure that they'll hook you up and sign that as well. Mark Parrish and the group at Northland Vodka are amazing. Everybody that we work with here on the Soda Pod are awesome people and they have great products. 5% of every sale goes back into local hockey as well. So not only are you getting a great product, not only are you supporting a great local company, but you're literally supporting local hockey as well. The best damn vodka on the planet, the best damn vodka in Minnesota. In the United States, Northland Vodka get you some today. A proud supporter of the Soda Pod. First, I'd like to propose a toast to UMD goaltender Alex Stalak. To Stalak! To Stalak! I love that stuff. Been drinking it for years. You know, I, I heard they recently decided to add more hops to it. Well, you all hopped out? no time so pardon this lack of composure exactly what my life ordered a lover and a friend riding on the same page walking at the same pace wondering how my life got here but you're here now this is my domain the way the people we see but this is my favorite right now. Love was inconceivable. Awesome stuff. As much as I want to drink everything on the shelf, we are here for beer, not whiskey. This is what we're actually here for. Exactly what my life Yeah. Gus be on the chat. <laughs> happy hour ladies and gentlemen and we are starting off with portage brewing unbelievable brewery in northern minnesota and we got the coffee cake blonde ale and i'm very excited about this one i love coffee as you guys know i love my beer as you guys know 
And I typically love a good coffee blonde ale. This one's a coffee cake blonde ale, so I imagine it's going to be on the sweeter side, which I'm a little scared of. But the reviews that I've seen on this, the write-ups that people have posted on Untapped have raised my eyebrows. I don't think this is gonna be our typical coffee blonde ale, especially because the beans have been barrel aged, so there's gonna be a kick to this. Let's take a first taste and then we'll dive into reading the can and see if my experience and reviews match that of the community. So cheers everybody. Whoa, that definitely packs a punch. <laughs> the brewery says it's their most popular breakfast beer. I mean, just give me all the bacon and eggs you have. I guess this pairs well with bacon and eggs, but what doesn't? Wow, despite it being like really layered, I would say more layered than rich. There's a lot going on, but it's not, it's not rich. It's still light, funny enough, but you get that tiny bit of barrel age kick. In this case, it's what I've read anyways, it's from their coffee beans, not necessarily the beer being barrel aged, which is why it's not rich and more light, but definitely layered with flavor. So it's like coffee, a little bit of sweetness. What I actually really like about this is that it's not super sweet. If you're not a fan of cinnamon, this ain't for you, because there's more of a cinnamon and spice kick at the end than there even is cake. And I guess that's part of the cake. I guess coffee cake does have some cinnamon in it, but they went very much heavier on the cinnamon side than they did on the, well, cinnamon and the coffee side, which is good. Then they did actually the sugar, the sweetness, which, hey, like I said, I like, but if you're not a huge fan of cinnamon, if you don't like that little bit of a spice kick in a beer, especially a Blondale, <clears throat> this one might not be for you, but it kind of hits you in this order. Coffee, hint of sweetness, and then ends with that spice, but all beautifully wrapped in a relatively light beer. Let's uh, take a look at the can here. It's pretty nice can art. Love the way Portage keeps their cans simple, but with that style that you know it's theirs. All right, so organic coffee, vanilla beans, and J cinnamon. Wow, fancy. Complex, crushable coffee vibes. This would be crushable for me, but I, I wouldn't put that on their on the can because I feel like that gives just Blondale folks the wrong message because this is this is complex but when you put complex and crushable next to each other eh, unless you're crazy like me I don't I think they kind of cancel each other out so yeah barrel aged coffee beans from their house blend which is called cafe Haven coming in at 5.2 percent 18 IBU I mean it's really really good it's got a little smoky touch to it I would say it's smooth I don't agree that it's super sweet layered with something that was also on the reviews that I just looked at now, which makes a lot of sense. It's layered like a cake, it's not as sweet as a cake, and again, if you if you don't mind that little bit of a spice cake, and it's not too much, but it, but it is there. It's not even too much to have a lingering, like, bite on your tongue or anything like that. But if you just don't want that in the Blondale, look, I get it. This was not what I expected. I thought this was gonna be a lighter Blondale that honestly wasn't even as rich in tone despite it being a coffee ale. You can get lighter ones, but for the most part they are a little bit darker. You don't get that cinnamon off the whiff either. It's nice, subtle hit of coffee. Then when you taste it, you get more of that coffee, which I like. And yeah, th this is a beautifully wrapped, layered, and complex blonde ale. Maybe one of the most complex blonde ales that I've ever had, but they didn't mess it up by making it too sweet and they didn't mess it up by going too much because it's perfectly balanced and this is incredible. Like I said, crushable for me, maybe not for thee, but I highly recommend this one if you're a fan of Portage Brewing. Cheers. If you like these reviews, don't forget to drop a comment below, like and subscribe, and I will see you on the next one. I told you guys that looked good, and it was good. Big shout out to our friends at Portage Brewing. Before we bring Seth on here, I just want to give a quick shout out to our friends at 7th Avenue Pizza. Guys, I don't care what you're ordering. I don't care if it's Giordano's. I don't care if it's Domino's. I don't care if it's Papa John's. I don't care if it's a good name or, quite frankly, a shit pizza like Domino's. 
throw it all away rip up the contact card and all because all you need is seventh avenue pizza in your life ladies and gentlemen yes obviously it's the best frozen pizza i argue it's the best pizza out there in the world the team are also so responsive and so active on social media as well if you ever need to find out where you can buy seventh avenue pizza if you need to find the answers on if they're on the shelves of your local grocery store hit up the boys and girls, the great team at 7th Avenue Pizza, at 7th Ave Pizza on all social media. I never have an issue when I need them. They're at Hy-Vee's, they're at Lunds and Byerly, Holiday Stations, Kowalski's, and more. And again, if your grocery store doesn't have them, contact Matt and the gang, or just ask your damn grocery store, why don't you have the best pizza in Minnesota yet on your shelves? Great people, amazing product, and an awesome local company. Get you some 7th Avenue Pizza today. On the other side, wild talk, hockey talk with our friend Seth Topo. Back another week with Seth Topo from Locked on Wild. Seth, how's it going, buddy? Doing good. Uh, fun, uh, fun game to watch uh, because we get a nice little glimpse into the future. Um, and I know it was Chicago, but it was it was fun to see the guys who were the ones that led to the win, you know, Jesper, Marco Rossi, Brock Faber, Kirill Kaprizov. It was nice. It was nice to see that little slice of these are going to be the guys going forward. It was nice to see them be the ones that impacted the win the most. Hey, Hartman back in the lineup too, which helps, which helps. Yeah. I know some people didn't like uh, Marcus Johansson's placement as a result, but Hey, they won the game. So can we really complain too much? <laughs> No, and there's there's not a ton that can there there's nothing that can be done right now on the Johansson front, and that'll be something that just has to be um figured out in the off season. Yeah. It's Hopefully either this is just a bad year for him, and he yeah. comes back to you know where where we're used to seeing him play, which is you know a, a solid a solid middle six guy. Yeah the the hope would be the hope is that for next year that he's not asked to be in that spot. Um, if you're not going to look to do any sort of a trade or a buyout situation, then the hope is just that he's lower in the lineup and you get somebody that steps in to be able to fill that second line wing spot more consistently. Yeah, no, for sure. For sure. Well, let's just rip the bandit off right now. Coming off a tough loss against the Winnipeg Jets, but a game where they battled. They didn't get absolutely blown out, blown out. They didn't get absolutely bullied. I would say that there are just some missed opportunities by the wild and though flurry played fine. It's not like he was outstanding. Like there were, I don't even want to say there was a couple goals that he could have, I don't know, shown more effort on or anything. It was just like the breakdown in front of him. It was just like, those were just goals that were going to happen. And yeah, maybe there could have been just a little bit more effort on some of them, but ultimately he didn't lose the game, but he didn't save the game where he maybe, you know, at least one of those, he could have shown, you know, some flurry brilliance, but I don't expect that from him every game. So I'm not going to point at him as the reason that the wild lost that game. It was just that the secondary scoring was not there. And there were a few defensive blunders. I love, and I hate to sound like a broken record, but Goligoski and Merrill again, it's true. So Kirill Kaprizov's nasty spinning backhand freaking goal was incredible. And his first goal was, um, or his second goal was amazing as well. That insane angle of a shot too. Great pass to him. So, hey, Kirill did what he had to do. Faber looked nothing short of outstanding. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure Bro Dean ended with a little bit more ice time than him, but I noticed Faber so much more. And that's not a knock on Bro Dean. You tend to notice the style of, of Faber a little bit more. Brodeen's always that more reserved type of defenseman, not as loud. But the fact that Faber was everywhere, and, and the big thing for me, Seth, what I really liked about Faber watching live and up close, big shout to Hoppy, by the way, for treating me to that wild game. It was awesome, despite the loss. It's cool hearing the, the Canadian national anthem for once, too. Um, <laughs> I really liked how he was talking to the guys when he would get, like, TV timeouts, when he'd get back on the ice. He looked like a leader. He was pointing, you know, this is what I'm going to do. Even in the last few seconds, even when the likes of Erickson Eck was dejected, knowing there's 10 seconds on the clock, we have one more play, we're, we're down, we're, we're not going to win the game. Faber was still dialed in, point like, you know, pointing around, making sure everyone knew what the play was, even if it was the last play, because 
he goes out on his shield, and that was really cool to see. Yeah, it is it is fun to see Faber just really step into a position of leadership on this team. It's not something you see a ton from somebody who is 21 years old. Yeah. Like he just, he has all the intangibles that you look for in somebody who is put in a position to lead. And, you know, it, he doesn't have any of the letters right now, but I think that's why so many of us that follow this team, so many of us that cover this team, are just pretty convinced at this point that he is going to be a future captain. He yeah. may wear the A for a year or two before he takes over the reins full time, but this dude just has captain material written all over him at some point in his career. And, you know, the 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 answers he gives after, after games, too, are just so thought out, yeah. so elaborate and detailed. So professional, too. Yeah, yeah. like he just... Everything that he does looks like somebody who has been at this for a long time. And, you know, to piggyback off of your assessment of the Jets game, I think the biggest thing that I came away surprised about with that game against the Jets, it just seemed like they kind of ground the wild into dust as the game wore off. They they just were they were physical. They kind of wore the wild out. But you'd expect that considering Winnipeg is in the top five in average height and average size in the NHL. I think they're number two in both yeah, they're metrics. Big. And the Minnesota Wild are dead last in both height and weight. So it's not surprising that Winnipeg ground up the bones of the Wild to make their bread. That's just what they do to everybody. They slow the game down. They limit opportunities. And... If I'm Connor Hellebuck, the thing that I'm upset most about is the fact that I probably have to buy a new mask because Kirill Kaprizov <laughs> dented the shit out of it. Um, sharp angle shots. He got him once like right in the nose with a shot. And so like I'm I'm annoyed at that. Like, dude, I, I get it. You're trying to score these sharp angle goals, but just cut me a break here and try not to <laughs> try not to take my face off. Man, I know I know players weren't shooting the puck like this back in the day, but it's still just like whenever I see that, I'm like, man, like hockey was played without goalie mass at one point. And again, guys are shooting lower. I get it. The, the game's advanced so much. No one was shooting like a Caprice at that point, but still, like there, the, the puck bouncing up and hitting you is still gonna. Yeah, even even the potential for a shot to accidentally get deflected into your face with no protection, no thank you. Insane. Yeah. Um, well, let's, let's talk a little bit about Boldy because you mentioned the physicality in the Winnipeg Jets game. And I thought Boldy actually did a really good job as being one of those guys who took a lot of the hits, who was thrown into the meat grinder. And that one, he played incredibly heavy up against the boards and he was kind of forced to play more of a power forward role in that game versus the jet against the Jets. So in hindsight, like I'm not surprised that. His offense was non-existent in that one. There was a there was two or three missed opportunities. Like there was a couple of bad passes that he had. Just he wasn't even really being uh, pressured. It was just like they weren't even close off the tape of his uh of the guy he was aiming to pass to. They were just bad angle passes. It seemed like he was almost too jittery to get the the puck off his stick. And I I I at the end of the day, I don't blame him given the type of game that he had to play against the Winnipeg Jets. And that was I'm one of the bigger guys on this team. I'm gonna have to take the brunt of of this and. I think for the most part, that's fine. He did where, where I was a little disappointed was just, he couldn't make up any of the offense as a result, but again, kind of like pointing at flurry and being like, ah, oh, you weren't the best that game. Like I had no issue with him other than just like those couple lapses. And then that's saying something, at least he was, there was other good takeaways from the game. Again, him being the one who was trying to make space for his line, making sure Rossi wasn't taking the brunt of that at all, either when they were playing together. What what I want to just say to the fans listening is we, we got to stop talking about trading this guy. I mean, A, it's too early. He's 22 years of age. He just signed an extension where next year, the year after, that could be a steal. Right now, it almost is, given his point production. Now, I get he's a streaky player, okay? But he's not just a pure scorer, which is a positive. He adds other elements to the game. Like I just said, he can play physical. He can help create space. Now, are you paying you know, six plus mil for a guy who just can create space. No, but he doesn't just bring that. He does bring the score and just sometimes it doesn't happen every single night. At least he does have other tools there. 
And I think he makes up for his lack of scoring in some games with not being quiet out there. Now, sometimes it's for the worse as he can take some penalties, but at least he's trying versus some of the other players out there were non-existent like a Gujo, non-existent like a Johansson at times. Um, I think he's going to get better. I think he's going to slowly become more consistent. And I think right now, this is one of the best valued lottery tickets you have because he could get better for the price you have him right now, which I think he will. And regardless, he's good. He's already almost a point per game player right now. 25, 30 goal score. I mean, Seth, the same, the same thing goes for Rossi and Kuzantino. Those are good lottery tickets to have right now because they're in the National Hockey League. Those two are even cheaper right now because they haven't like pop pop yet. I don't think we've seen the best of Boldy either and they've already locked him up. So I think you take the good with the bad at this point, knowing that the good outweighs that and this is just a negative time of the year. We're, we're just dogging on everything. I know a lot of people have been suggesting this to you on your streams and on Locked on Wild. I mean, I just gave my piece. Why should, the, why should we stop talking about trading Boldy and why should the Wild keep him? Well, I've got... Uh, and, and look, is we there are a few things that we need to acknowledge. Matt Boldy is like he just turned 23. So he's young. He has scored over the last two seasons 57 goals. He has damn near 200 points in his career so far before he has turned 25. Yeah, like, it's amazing. he is on his second full season in the NHL. And listen to these numbers. Like, I'm not doing this to discount the first 19 games of the season in which he only had one goal. Like, that that happened but in the 58 games he's played since since john hines took over he has 25 goals and 28 assists he is second on the team in goals behind Kirill. he is second on the team in points behind Kirill in that same span yet he is second behind he is second behind Kirill kaprizov in power play goals and in, he is third on the team behind Kirill and Matt Zuccarello in power play points in that span. He's shooting 14.4%, averaging 19 minutes per game. He is like, he is exactly what the Wild have needed him to be. Is he inconsistent? Sure. Does he have moments where you would like to see him maybe tap in a goal or two more than he does? Absolutely. But Isha, this is the crux of young players is that they are figuring out how to do it on the fly. And Matt Boldy has not hit his prime yet. Like he still has a few years before he gets to his prime. Oh yeah. And if he improves his finishing percentage, by a couple of percentage points. He's a 40 goal guy. Like he still generates a ton of opportunities by being on the same line as Kirill and Jewel Eriksson. Like I know we've seen some mix of lines here down the stretch. That will be unless there's a major trade made. That will be your top line next year. And Kaprizov, Eriksson and Boldy generate enough opportunities that if Matt Boldy if he works on his, if he, if he just spends the off season shooting the puck and working on finishing, he could be a 40 goal guy next year. His pace under John Hines, 30 goals, 75 points over an 82 game season. That's, that's pretty good. Why are we complaining? Why are we complaining? It makes because no sense. He swings and misses on a couple of goal, a, a couple of shots. Like, yeah, it's it, it blows my mind. Like, I, and I'm not like you said, the first part of the season it happened. Does he go on streaks? Yeah, but he makes up for it. Unlike some players who go on cold streaks and we don't see them till the next year. Like, at least he corrects it within season, and he's he plays, he wears his heart out on his sleeve. Like he'll play an aggressive game for better or for worse. At, at least he cares, and at least out there he's tightened that up too, and he's creating space for his line mates, even if he's not scoring. Which is what I saw in the Winnipeg game, which is why it's a it's an example why I wanted to bring this and as well. Because like he, he didn't have a good offensive game in that one, but at least he was physical against yeah. a big team that at, someone on the Wild needed to be physical. And he was like, you know what? 
that's going to have to be me. It's going to have to be me. And he did a good job for the most part. They didn't win the game, but he was throwing some good hits. He was taking, he was at least pushing guys off of pucks in uh, in their own zone at times too, which was good. But and if uh, he one adds, example, if he ahead. adds 15 or 20 pounds to his frame, which is something that can be a goal for him over the next couple of seasons, he's going to be a monster. Yeah. Cause he's already like, huge. Yeah. You, are you kidding me? Like you put Jewel Erickson, who already is with him and Kirill. Good luck shutting that line down. Oh yeah. Hundred percent, and and this is like an example too, where young goalies, well, goalies and defensemen seem to pop a little bit later than forwards. But like, look at Mika Zibanejad. He had how many years with the Ottawa Senators? A late first rounder or mid first rounder? Everybody knew he was good. He was only a forty to fifty point guy with the Senators at best, right? And when he was given a little bit of room put with some good guys and actually developed, he turned into a point per game player like he is now in the, with the New York Rangers. It's not like the New York, I know the New York Rangers are really good this year, but it's not like they've been in a, they're not like Tampa Bay. They're not like Toronto. They're not like a team where, you, you know, you plug in next to a Marner or Matthews or Stamkos or Kucherov and like, of course you're going to get points. It's like, no, he went to a New York team where yes, there was Panarin, but they're not always on the same line. He's on, he's been with Kreider at times. Like, you know, like, we have to wait a little bit. And the fact that Boldy is already, in my opinion, better than like that example, right? On a team that, you know, better than the Ottawa Senators were back then. Yes, but still not a playoff team. Give him some time. He's already better than most guys his age who are given this step, given this opportunity. And he may not be checking all the boxes at all times, but for the most part, like you said, 70 point player. You know, that was his pace. He's going to be pretty much what, like five points off a point per game player at the end of the season. Yeah. Let's pump the brakes on trading a core piece of this team that they still have, in my opinion, as a deal, because he's going to get better. He's going to be more consistent. He's going to be 70 to 80 points moving forward. People are acting like he is the second option on this team. Like, and it's a bad thing. He's the second option on this team because this team has Kirill Kaprizov. Yeah. Like. And he's not Kirill. Kirill is Kirill. Kirill is a superstar. Nobody is Kirill. Kirill's one of the best players in the league. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just like people well, he's are. He's a top line player, but he's not an extraordinary elite talent. And Kirill's what? He's he's getting closer to 30. Now I know he came in at 20. Like you just can't even it's it's apples to oranges. Their developmental yeah. trajectory too, right? So it's just like yeah. People are people are ripping him like they expect him to be the first option. Like he's not ever going to be the first option with this team because they have Kirill Kaprizov. Like everybody just everybody I get the frustration that this is a season that has not played out in the way that anybody had hoped that it would. Um, but like we got to we got to pump the tires. There are players to be frustrated about for sure. There are players we would like to see more from. Boldy falls into that category, but Boldy is not somebody that sh people should be frustrated with this season. Like give me a break. Like yeah. just nitpicky at this point. It's, it really is. So yeah, so Mika Zabinijad, his his last season with the Senators, fifty one points before then forty six before then thirty three and twenty. Now twenty was in only a forty two game stretch. Goes to the Rangers, first year with the Rangers, didn't do that great. Okay, then started to cook, and now he's a ninety to eighty point player in the league. Right? It took he's, Jewel he's, Act he's thirty years four of age seasons to really come on. Yeah. Matt Boldy has already two. hit a level that Jewel Erickson just reached. Now I know Jewel Different Erickson players, is yeah. far better defensively. Different type of player, center. but still we're talking about developmental range on them reaching why they were drafted, like reaching yeah. their potential of the style of play that they were projected to be. No, I get it hundred percent. So, so there's our message to you guys. There's our opinion. Stop suggesting that the wild trade Boldy. It's, yeah, it's it, it does unless they're going full rebuild, which they are not. No, he's a core of the piece of this team. He's part of the blueprint moving forward. Deal with it. Yeah. Um, and, and again, just quick to, just to clarify, like there's nothing wrong with wanting to see a young player take a step. 
no problem with or that critique, whatsoever. Critique a player on the, the team that you like. It's just mm -hmm. getting out of hand. But just the the people that say Boldy's terrible, he just is insanely lazy, like he's not trying out there. He golfs too much. Miss, miss me with that. Miss me with the golf thing a hundred percent. Oh my goodness. Um, all right, let's uh let's 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 talk some positives here. <laughs> not the best day. And I say day because it was the Concords were blinding at the XL Energy Center by the time the game was done. Still, so sun wasn't even close to setting yet, which was a beautiful thing. I, I kind of like that those like three o'clock games. It's kind of like perfect. It's kind of perfect. Chef it's kid. not as early as like the one, which is just still. It's just weird to go to a hockey game at that point, especially NHL. But I, I liked, I liked uh, the the sun at the end of the game. Still, um, today an earlier game on the road in Chicago and a perfect opportunity. Tail of a back to back, so you're not going to put Flurry in net. Gustin, we know he's not going in right now. Jesper Wallstead gets called up, and this couldn't be a better opportunity. They needed to play a different goalie, anyways, and it's against Chicago, a team that's very beatable all season, but especially at this point in the year as they're, you know, shuffling things around to seeing what they have. So great opportunity. I feel like Husandinov, who didn't have the best game in Winnipeg, Ro Rossi, who didn't have the best game against Winnipeg, I should say, back at home. Um, they looked incredible, mind you, against an easier team, which was good to get their confidence back. And Wallstat, night and day compared to his debut. Talk us through just the young guns here. We won't dissect the whole game because you've already done that. Um, so everyone go check out Seth's breakdown and podcast of that game but uh just let's talk about the young guys what did you like about rossi what did you like about who's and how good did wallstat good or did wallstat look especially having to face a few high danger shots it wasn't like it was just a layup now overall yes but like there were still some challenges it wasn't dallas bad but talk us through it uh, I I was I was real impressed with Jesper and he talked about it after the game with Kevin Gorg in just one of the things that he really wanted to try to work on was being in better position to handle shots kind of was caught out of position a couple of times against Dallas and I think to be honest I've said this you know I've said this ever since the start happened it just felt like he maybe wasn't ready for the NHL speed that shots come in at. It's different. It's it's a it's it is. such a big level up from the the AHL. Like you get buzzed by one 100 mile an hour shot, and you're like, okay, this yeah, is this is the show. Okay, this is a little different. And all but the he, shots are coming that fast. <laughs> he talked about it like he said, I just wanted to work on getting in better position to handle shots. He wasn't like reaching for shot attempts here today. He just did a great job of staying in position and reacting accordingly. And to your point, he he faced some some looks in close. But I was I was really impressed with the job the Wild did too of making sure that he didn't get overwhelmed. Of right. the 34 shot attempts that he faced, 30 of them were low danger. There you go. Four of the 34 were medium or high danger. That is a great way to keep your goalie clean. Ease him in, yeah. And like, I honestly, I think there probably was a little bit of a realization by the players of like, we really let Jesper down the last time he was here. Like, we really, we oh, really yeah. did him no favors. And so it felt like there was kind of a little bit of, dare I say, a point of pride to try to make sure that he didn't suffer the same fate. Um, Faber made that really did. clear in his pregame. Like, yeah, he, he, like, he was just like, no, we need to, we didn't, we didn't give him a good opportunity last time. So we got to play better in front of him. Like he was, he was blunt with it. Yeah. And, you know, even going from him, because I, I thought, yes, I thought he was great from start to finish. Like I was, I did a nice fist bump when Rossi scored on that shot from the, the face off circle because, that has been one thing I kind of have wanted to see a little more from Marco. Like he does such a great job of getting to the net and gobbling up those loose pucks and just jamming them home uh, against the goalie. That is, I think the next step of his progression too, is to just have his shots, like his shot arsenal 
just pull a little bit further out from the net. Like right. you, you, it's it's a great base to have. It's a great base to have to default to the front of the net. And so he's got that part down. Now you just start to pull your shot away from the net a little bit so that you can become, that's how you go from being like a 15 to a 20 goal guy to a 25 to a 30 goal guy. Yeah. And I, I thought that was great to see here today. And then, you know, Marat too, like I, I just will never get tired of seeing him just blaze through to the puck and go push somebody out of the way to take it from him. Like he still has that fearless attitude, something that is, I think will needed on this team. And the fact that we went from Jewel Erickson Eck and like Hartman, Goudreau, and whoever else on the fourth line to now it feels like you have some pretty good footing with Erickson Eck, Rossi, and who's Nadinov down the middle. That is a way that teams start to get things kind of figured out is, okay, we've got our centers. Now we just got to figure out the wing spots. Yep. No, for sure. It just, that makes me so happy because I watched, I watched bits and pieces of the game. I was just super busy here today. And then I caught up on the extended highlights and listened to a few of the interviews. And before bringing Seth on, I was, you know, sending him a couple messages and like this, is what we're going to talk about. And I, I'm just so glad that you saw a little bit of what I saw, but because you watched the full game, covered it, did the, did the watch uh, party and everything. I'm so glad that a the team played better in front of him and he was kind of e- eased into an NHL starter role this one versus welcome to the show. You're against Dallas. Oh, and we played a bad game in front of you too. We're just like, we, we hung you out to dry, even though like seven goals is seven goals. He knows that wasn't a good performance, but it, it's good to hear and quite frankly, see that some of those adjustments that he knew he had to make going back to the AHL that he has been working on. And that's, that's amazing. That's 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 what you want to see. And and he's checked every developmental box other than yeah. having a stinker in his first ever NHL game. He's which tends to happen with young goalies. Let's be honest. I've seen it in Vancouver time and time again as well. Um, other than that, tiny little speck on his resume. The developmental path has been seamless for him, which can't be can't you can't really say the same for many wild prospects other than Boldy, to be honest. Yeah, who've come well, in? It's been it's been a little bit more of a slower. But I mean, look at Rossi, man. That one's been the craziest out of them all. Kareel stayed in Russia, right? You know, like it's just uh, Wallstat's here. Yeah, I mean, Murat, the book is still out on him a little bit, but if he comes out forty points next year, thirty five points, it looks good. It's like okay, he's checked that box too. So that's positive. And speaking of another one who's again hasn't necessarily checked all the boxes yet, but now is getting the opportunity to at least get some looks is Liam Ugrin in Iowa. Hasn't scored in his two games there, but has actually looked good. No points yet. Looks fine to good is where I'd rate him right now. He doesn't look out of place, but he was quite frankly interviewed uh before his first game, I think across the pond did a or on the pond or whatever the the wilds podcast that they do beyond the pond beyond the pond. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> My guy here. I only know that because I was just like, I just saw something from them scroll across my Twitter feed. I should know it. Cause I have it on my outline, but that tab isn't open, but whatever Seth saved me. So we're good. And they interviewed him pregame and basically said the, like, you know, kind of like with the world juniors, like the small ice messes with me because I've been playing pro high level pro and he even and his English is so good, by the way. Um, I, I'm I'm always impressed to hear him. Like he 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 can speak English. Like most Swedes can when they come over because yeah. they learn it in school or like once they know they're going to be playing pro, they like they're just good with languages, I guess. But it's it's near flawless. So he explained it perfectly. How like the ice? There's some small differences and small adjustments that he has to make, but. Overall, he said, I took a step in maturity, both in my game and as an adult in playing in the SHL, playing with men, playing in the highest level league over there. And it really helped my game. And now I figured I'm, I've got everything I can out of there and it's time to, to do it over here. And he's going to be playing for Sweden at the world championships. Now back to big ice again, which I don't know. This seems a little counterproductive, but at least he's still playing hockey. And I'm going to say like playing in the world championship, like that's not a hindrance at all. Play like these guys need to get as much time as they can playing with some of the best players and against 
some of the best players that they can out there when their team is not in the playoffs. So he's going to ride uh, the stretch here with Iowa, but I also saw the MN wild prospects, MNW prospects on Twitter. If you guys want to follow them, they had great reviews. Um, so despite him being held pointless in a dash three, he got some power play time already too. So he's gotten some good looks and uh, I like this because the, Iowa sucks right now. Like they're not making the playoffs. They're switching things around. They're literally bringing in first off Ugrin, giving guys who maybe didn't have the elevated roles some more elevated roles to see what they got next season. And first off, by the way, he got he's got two goals the other night, which was awesome. He had a two goal night, so he's looking good. But uh, I don't know. That's doing some research, seeing what other people have been saying about him, listening to his interviews and watching whatever tape I uh, I could from those last two games. I like what I see from Rugen thus far. It's kind of like Murad. He doesn't have a lot of points yet, but right into the fire and he looks comfortable. He's not a boy amongst men. Like he he's there. And it was cool to also see first off with his new opportunity look motivated and, and look good as well. Um, I don't know. What have you heard from from uh you know your inner circle about either of these two guys? And if it is it similar to what I was uh what I was highlighting? Yeah, I, I think a lot of what I've heard vibes with what you what you ran through is that Ugrin looks, you know, he looks comfortable. The hope I think is with all these guys is that you you throw them into the water so to speak and they like they swim pretty quickly yeah that they are at least float yeah they're (laughs) able to get accustomed to this level and before too long they kind of rise to the top uh to separate themselves and to then put themselves in position to either be call-ups or to make the team out of um out of camp next year and tinfoil hat theory here i've had a lot of tinfoil hat theories this year but this one just came to me what do you think about this 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 probably this probably is just me trying to connect some dots but you know the other part about giving players no move or no trade clauses is that then in order to move them, you have to discuss it with them. So what if Bill Guerin gave a bunch of those out as a way to, well, these guys will be placeholders until the prospects are ready. And then when the prospects are ready, then I will have the talk with those guys and we'll figure out what to do with the Freddie Goudreau's, with the Marcus Johansson's, with the the others that would end up being potentially moved. Like it kind of feels like maybe, but also it feels in my head like, well, why would you sign them to, why would you send them to no move clauses in the first place? Yeah. Or or like the term, if you're going to do no move, then why'd you give them all that term? I'm, I'm just talking. I'm just in my, my head is just bouncing around and, um, I don't know. That sounded good in my head, but it probably. I feel like for, uh, you know. I'll be. I'll be honest. Said like for a, a few of them, sure. For all of them, which is most of them. Yeah. It that like you're going full Mike Gillis Canucks, and these guys aren't guys that you. This this isn't Ryan Kessler taking a pay cut. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's this it's is just, Freddie fucking Goudreau. It's too who's much making power. The same amount of money as Kessler did with his Canucks. Now I know that was yeah. 10, 15 years ago. I I, I understand it. You know what I mean? Like they're paying him a good chunk of money and he ain't scoring fucking 40 goals. So and he, and he, and he has the luxury of no move to. So like, yeah, it's, it's too much power for a hypothetical. Uh, don't cut. Do not cut that out, though, because that <laughs> I want people to have a good example of kind of where my brain goes when I wander. Well, it's just like sometimes you like I don't blame you. Sometimes we're like trying to make sense. But dude, I defended Jim Benning for eight fucking years. It was only on year nine and ten where I was like, I can't do this anymore. Or I guess some seven years on year, you know, nine. I was like, I can't do this anymore. I well, can't be I've the been... one guy to find that one speck of positivity for the Vancouver Canucks, which was he drafted Pedersen. I've been talking all season about how I don't think the lineup decisions are being made by John Hines. How tinfoil hat is that? Yeah, we we had a long conversation about that over beers on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we did. And we will continue to have that conversation probably towards the end of the stretcher. So we'll put that one on the shelf. But uh, Seth, let's move on from the wild talk here. I got some tidbits. We'll 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 fire through these NHL stories. There's two of them that have like a little weight to them. But this one article that I 
read and pulled from the hockey news was awesome. I will link it in the description of the video here on YouTube and in the description of the podcast. And Seth, I encourage you to check it out as well. Um, let's go through seven interesting deals signed in the NHL this last month. And again, that's the title of the article. Hockey News did a really good job with this one. I'm going to speed run through these guys, Seth. But if there's anyone that you're like, oh, wait, I know that guy. This is why. Like, feel free to jump in. And sure. if not, I learned a, uh, a lot about some of these guys as well. As I don't follow the college scene as much. I'm mostly NHL and junior. And I know you're just pretty much all focused on the wild right now as well. <laughs> but that's why I wanted to bring it up here because I figured, you know, these are some names that, okay, will be on our radar moving forward now. We'll be on the listener's radar and just show that, like, there are some diamonds in the rough still coming out of college. And some guys who came out of college last year who just picked up late and teams have locked them up. So again, really good article. Love that the hockey news continues to put these type of lists and breakdowns uh, up on their blog, but let's start with number one, Scott Morrow. He's a defenseman signed by the Carolina hurricanes. Again, this is all in this last month. Um, he had 30 points and six goals in his last season in college. And overall, had 94 points in 109 games played as a defenseman. So, you know, there's a there's one guy to keep your eye out on. Again, Carolina guy, but could be a good name, could be a good steal for them moving forward. Colin Graff, and I know a lot of our friends were talking about Colin uh, Graff. He, the San Jose Sharks signed him. He was a key member of Quinnipiac. Played in the NCAA uh, last year, but stayed in school to round out his game and become a bit better all around. He again, what a what a steal from the San Jose Sharks. He's already playing in their lineup, and last year he's a right winger in 34 games played. He had 22 goals and 49 points in 112 college games. He got 130 points. So this guy's a key Jeez. free pickup for the San Jose Sharks. Little scrawny guy at the NHL level, but they're giving him some time here, and he's been looking pretty good. Uh, next is a center, but will probably be a wing if he plays pro. Toronto Maple Leafs have signed Jacob uh, Quillen, or Quillen, my apologies, and he's a teammate of Graf uh, at Quinnipiac. Quinnipiac, you know, tends to have older older players on their roster. That's how their program works. The men against boys. That's how they fucking beat the Gophers, amongst other things. A couple. Of years ago or last year but anyways we won't go there um he had 46 points in 39 games played in 17 goals this year again play center at the college level will, will probably be a wing in pro and overall in uh, 116 games played he had 93 points another guy who was signed by the anaheim ducks and this one's interesting he was a he's a goalie seth okay and i know on your last episode we were talking about how the Minnesota Wild need to roll the dice and maybe bring in some goalies to see what they have for the future. And right on cue, they signed one of their guys, which was which was awesome to see. But why I bring that up is because we were just having that conversation. And this is a guy that undrafted, undrafted, okay, two year in the WHL where he had a respectable 91 save percentage and three goals against in 46 games for the Tri-City Americans um in his last season in the whl which was 2022 2023 he's 20 years of age he played eight games in the echl this year pro he was given a you know a deal by anaheim um he played with the san diego goals of the ahl I, I i honestly think he had an ahl deal like i don't even think he was an nhl player like i think the goals signed him and it doesn't say in detail in this article but i think the goals had him he was under an ahl contract Dude, in 26 games, upon being called up from Tulsa of the ECHL to the, a uh, the AHL, played 26 games, 13 wins, 9 losses, and he had a save percentage of better than even in the NHL, 91-3, and had 2.7 goals against. So good that they, the Anaheim Ducks have something. He's 20. 20 wow. undrafted. Yeah, this kid, I mean, what what's a good random chip, you know, to get in your system and, and continue to see if he's got it. He's from the Czech Republic as well. So he's already used to North American play, playing in the dub for two years. Um, and he played uh, two years World Junior with the Czech team as well, 2022 and 2023. He was their starting goalie. He played all seven games. Um, and funny enough, no joke, had four assists last year at the World Juniors. <laughs> That's what we like. Uh, we we like the oh goalies that get involved in the uh, in the game plan. So I like to hear that. And for listeners, like 
I'm I'm excited to you know the signing you mentioned, uh, Samuel Lavage, um, that the uh, Minnesota Wild signs. I don't. I'm hoping that's the pronunciation because I just really Lavage. want to be able to say that I've nailed it on the first try. Sounds um, French, so <laughs> looks looks like looks like that might be it. Lav maybe actually it looks like it's pronounced Lavai. Ah. So damn it, I didn't nail it. But um, I'm gonna try to di uh, dive a little bit into uh, what Samuel Levi brings to the table uh, for the Wild because, like you said, the, like not too long after we recorded, Wild go out and get another young goalie to add to the system, and so I'm uh, I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued by what uh, what he could bring. Yeah, no, let's either do a deep dive next week on this episode or if you want to talk about Unlocked On. I'll, I'll come prepared with some notes either way because I'm I'm intrigued as well. And like I said, they're, they're going to give any guys some playing time right now just, just to see what they got before yes. summer, you know, off-season training, um, prospects camp, and then obviously the real deal, James Neal training camp. Uh, two more I want to dive into here, Seth, or I guess three more. We have Sam Lipkin. Now, he was also out of Quinnipiac, but he was drafted actually the last pick in the 2021 draft. He was the seventh round last pick 223 coming off a USHL season where he in 59 games put up 36 goals and 71 points. He's a center Jeez. played two years Quinnipiac and he uh, last year had 35 points, 15 goals in 39 games. In total, he played two years of college, 78 games played, 78 points. He was a point per game. But yeah, his his numbers in the in the USHL, especially his last season with the Chicago Steel, was outstanding. He played one game in, in Tucson this year as the Arizona Coyotes have locked him up. They're the ones who drafted him um, in 2021, and they liked what they saw in Quinnipiac. So I don't know if he becomes anything makes any noise at the NHL level, but I think he's a good AHL option and you know he's still young enough where we'll see what happens. I hate this one because Chicago, they got a good one here. Uh Landon Slaggert, which oh, what a last name. Um pretty elite. Pretty elite. Already playing some NHL games. So they they locked him up and now he's getting some time with him. He only has two assists in 11 NHL games thus far. He played all five years in the big 10 with Notre Notre Dame. And he um, was three years at the U S uh, national development program before that in his last season, 36 games, 20 goals, 31 points playing for uh, Notre Dame in 136 game pl games played total in college hockey. He's actually got 92 points. He's a left winger who the, the struggled Blackhawks like enough even at this stage in the season to put him in the NHL lineup and, and, and see what he has. And, you know, he played his eight games. They liked him. They locked him up now. And so he's won, uh, he's 21 years old. So he's still relatively young, uh, but consistently got better every year uh, in college, which was good to see. Hate that with, Trump, or with the Blackhawks. That's what you're hoping to see from these young guys is just little incremental improvements. Yeah. And the Calgary Flames, when they made the deal with the Vancouver Canucks for Elias, uh, well, trading Elias Lindholm, everyone knows that uh, Kuzmenko was involved in that deal, Andre Kuzmenko. But the other piece um, was a Vancouver Canucks defensive prospect who they just inked, who has had a tremendous season in the OHL for the Kitchener Rangers. Hunter, oh God, Brzezic? B R Z U S T E W I C Z. Bru sure. <laughs> um, he is American, but I feel like he's Czech as fuck, or his grandpa was from the Czech Republic, or something like that, because that just seems like either Polish or Czech. You know the way that uh, his I last am going name to is. Take spoke. your word on that pronunciation. So in 2021, 2022, Seth, he actually played for the U.S. Uh, National Development Program. Nine points, nine assists. He's a defenseman, a right-handed defenseman. Didn't light up the lamp. Decides to go play in Canada in the major junior, OHL. First year, lights it up. Last year, oh my God, dude. He went from 57 points in 68 games. Good output for a defenseman. 92 points this year in 67 games. He was a third-round pick for the Vancouver Canucks in 2023, so someone who they were confident on, on grabbing last year. 
and he's just buzzing. So the Flames have locked him up. He's like he's 19, so he's likely going to get a shot development camp or whatever. They're probably going to give him a few games because Calgary Flames, let's be honest, are not going to be competitive next year. They're going to give him a few games, and if he's not ready, they'll probably send him back down to junior because if you're under 20, you have to go play in junior. You can't play in fucking pro at 19, which is absolutely ridiculous. DHL needs to change that rule, but it is what it is. Um, in a hundred and in 135 games played for the OHL in two years, 149 points. He's a defenseman. Jeez. He's a defenseman. So he's got that offensive touch, which I mean, you can't you can't teach that. You can't teach that, right? You can work on defensive stuff, but you can't teach that that style. Now I haven't seen how quick he is, even as a Vancouver Canucks fan. I didn't I didn't put I didn't keep too many tabs on him because it was early. It was like I didn't watch much of Charlie Stramel this year. Even though he wasn't good, it was just like, you know, we'll, we'll see what he has next year. It's it's not like he's coming into the wild one year after. I felt the same way about this kid. I was like, okay, he's going back to Kitchener. I He was totally off my radar as soon as he was traded, too. And I was like, I didn't realize how good he was. But uh, best for last, the Flames got a good one with that prospect, especially since Kuzmenko's not really playing as good as he did in Vancouver. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been a bit of a weird adjustment. That I, I forgot just how many pieces were involved in that trade and like Kuzmenko goes from being a guy who kind of came on the scene with Vancouver, but then Vancouver was like, well, we're not going to be able to pay him. So they send him to Calgary and he just, he has not performed at the same level. Who'd have thought that by leaving a void, uh, leaving the talent with the likes of JT Miller, uh, Elias Patterson, Brock Besser, like who would have thought leaving that talent pool would cause you to struggle scoring goals. Yeah, well, I mean, proves him, but he he was struggling even this year because they, they signed him to a two year like bridge extension, like four point five mil or whatever. Because he's coming off freaking forty goals, and he just him and Talkit just didn't vibe. And yeah. Talkit was scratching him. He wasn't putting him with the guys where he had success. And he was still he's still a happy go lucky guy, but it was just it just wasn't working. And I don't think he's a bad player. I think he's a very good player. I don't think he's elite, but I think he's a very good player. I think he's a top six player. I just think coaches have to put him, surround him with guys that will just allow him to do his thing because yeah. he's not setting anything up. He's not quick. So he's not going end to end. He's not going to be chasing. He has to be, He they have to give him the puck and let him do his thing in the offensive zone. Um, and it, that just hasn't worked with the second part of with Vancouver and, and with the Flames, but um, still valuable at only 28 years of age. So I understand the the haul even you know, even with uh, Lindholm going the other way. Would have looked real good on that second line for the Minnesota Wilds. It's pretty cheap, too. Dude, he would have oh, been instantly man. a fan favorite. Could you instantly imagine? Could you imagine Zuccarello, Rossi, Kuzmenko? Oh, vibes, vibes, vibes. So many vibes. Yeah. I've always loved Kuzmenko. If he doesn't stay with the Flames, I am I'm more than happy with the Wild entertaining that if they have the money. Because Well, that's the thing. It's always the if they have the money is going to be this. We're still going to be talking about that. I swear. Even, just when been, the, even when Suter and Parise contracts, you know, are off the books, we're still going to be saying that with how many guys they're paying now. Yeah. Cause then you got Faber, you got Rossi. Those guys will need Freddie like, Goudreau. It's, it's funny how much window shopping I have done and will continue to do with no money. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. All right. A few more, uh, We'll fire through these, but some few more NHL stories out there. And one interesting one. Um, newly signed goalie, but he's been in their system for a while. Ivan Fedotov for the Philadelphia Flyers is there, is playing, is in the NHL. Now, yeah, he went from military service back to playing pro hockey. It's actually been a crazy journey for this young man after an eight and a half years since he was drafted in 2015 Fedotov's NHL dream finally happened Seth finally materialized he finally reached it he's 27 years of age and he's joined the Philadelphia Flyers um the first week of April in 2022 he was detained for alleged military ser- or alleged military service evasion in Russia Okay, so he had to fulfill his duty uh, to serve before he could come back and play hockey. So he actually went and continued to play in in Russia. 
um, while he was doing his military service, which was, I, I imagine at this point, like glorified office work, but just being, being available if they needed anything, which Russia's active in war right now. So, I mean, it, it was, there's a very possibility that he could have gotten the call. Um, and while he was still there, he played funny enough, uh, for CSK Moscow. Surprise, surprise. Sure. Um, and all while his NHL contract still remained valid, there was a lot of uncertainty surrounding his future, but the Flyers kept some sort of line of communication with him and his team, and quite frankly, Russia and CSKA. And a new chapter is here. His contract was terminated uh, Friday, I don't know if it was March 30th, but the last Friday of March, and he was introduced as a flyer. And he said, it's been a long time coming. Now I'm here. He is six foot seven, Seth, 200 pounds. And he immediately became the backup. Yeah. He immediately became the backup there. Now, the Flyers haven't done too well since. I'm not blaming him. I'm not blaming him. Um, but just what a crazy story, man. What a crazy story. And Torts brought him in with open arms, man. You know, Torts got a soft spot for anyone, I think, who has a military background now as a proud American, maybe not for Russia, but I don't think he blames this goalie. Let's be perfectly honest here. Um, and yeah, Danny Breer was quoted saying, you know how it works here. If he's good enough to play, he's going to play. He'll be available. He'll be on the ice. He'll be with the team practicing and the coaching staff will have to decide if they want to use him or not, but we like him and he's here to stay, which is, which is pretty cool. And despite all the challenges that he faced Seth, he's maintained his pretty good performance. Last year in Moscow, he recorded a 2.37 goals against average, 91 save percentage, and had four shutouts in 44 games, wow. while also being available and doing military service and tasks as well. And he was actually a finalist in 2021-2022 uh, for the KHL's Best Goalie Award, um, and it led to a CSK, CSKA Moscow Championship. And he even represented the... <laughs> Olympic athletes of Russia uh, in Beijing in, in 2022 as well. So what a story for this guy, man. Despite yeah. kind of being held, I don't want to say like against his will, but he like it's every guy's dream to make that real money in the NHL. Despite that being his dream, he had to develop in Russia. That was that was the plan. But right when he was ready to come over, they like made him stay. But it's it's cool to see that he like. Finally, they got that all figured out. His contract was terminated, and uh, he's in North America. He's in North America. But uh, we don't see this every day now that Russia is now called the Soviet Union, where we're seeing guys literally escape a la Alex Mogilny, who came over, right? So when this came across my table, I was like, this is crazy. And I know you had a similar reaction. Yeah, it's it's just a good example of if you have something that you want to accomplish, if you have a dream, if you have a goal, Stick with it. Like, just no matter the odds, there is nothing that should stand between you and what you want to accomplish. And I know this is obviously an extreme case of that because it is, uh, you know, mandatory military service. But, you know, the other thing that this reminds you of, too, is remember all those stories about uh, that that story that popped up about Kirill possibly getting detained for using a fake military id uh um, i know it well because i i made i was with, i was still with thpn and we were blogging on our site and i made like a fake like soviet badge or like name tag and i put his face on it and i was remember there was like something that fell out fell out of his um like there was some of like equipment malfunction like, over that like fell on the ice and now my, my joke and my bit was like oh yeah he's a spy like that was his, you know, little like that was his microphone or his like transmission or whatever. And so the 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 vlog picture was literally like a Russian passport or whatever, some Russian Soviet badge, and I put his face on all black and white image. <laughs> so yes, I know. <laughs> wild times we live in. Weird, not wild. Maybe both. <laughs> um, another crazy story here, Seth, that uh just Blew my mind because even in the National Hockey League, we don't hear about um, performance enhancing drugs. We really don't. Like if 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 a player uses drugs, there the headline for us is usually player <clears throat> Evgeny Kuznetsov player going into the 
sub not even substance abuse program player but, assistance you know, player assistance program and then yeah. usually we'll we'll get more of the story fallout after like a few weeks um and, and i'm not making fun of of any of Genny kuznetsov is just like he has a track record okay and every time that he does enter he seems to come out and and do better so credit to him i hope he continues to to stay healthy and, and, and clean and, and all that. It's just, that's the name that comes to mind. Let's be honest. He, he always be soaring. He be soaring high. Let's be honest. We've seen it. He did it himself posting that video. It's it's forever going to be a, a butt of a joke. And again, knock on wood, he just stays healthy. Um, But uh, we don't hear these days anyways, players on performance enhancing drugs. Hell, even using cannabis. Whereas in the NFL, we see that a lot. In MMA, we see that a lot. And someone who covers fighting, boxing, combat, you know, most combat sports, especially those outside of the UFC, there's there's a stigma around certain leagues that let you get away with it for entertainment factor. So I'm kind of jaded to fighters being flagged for it because there have been UFC champions who've been like TJ Dillashaw. He had a two-year suspension in his prime. Because he, you know, he was caught using uh, not steroids but EPO. Well, we have a WHL player who was just flagged, Seth. Just last week, um, a Brandon Wheat Kings forward of the WHL suspended for eight games. His name is Matt Henry. He violated uh, or for a violation of a prohibited substance. Now, the article was a short article. Four or five small paragraphs. I read the first one from the CBC, and there was the Globe and Mail, and then ESPN, you know, caught on to it. And then it was basically just like copy and paste, you know, kind of like what they do through like Pioneer Press, for example, that have their links with some of the other world news. They just kind of repurpose the same article, put the little credit under it. And it was like the same story essentially of every publication. But it, what happened was he tested positive for a performance enhancing substance. I quote, he's going into counseling. This is his first violation, and the team in the league are working with him. That's all I got from the article that was first posted when this broke from the CBC. With that verbiage, despite it saying performance enhancing, given that he's more of a enforcer, even at the WHL level, people you know said like, "Well, you still have to have skill for this one." I'm not saying he doesn't have skill, Seth, but let, let me just bring up his stats here, and you'll see what I mean. Um, hold on, hockey DB. He played one year for the SH SHL, the Junior A League in Saskatchewan. Which some guys get drafted out of the AJHL. Hardly anybody gets drafted out of the. No one gets drafted out of the SJHL. Let's be perfectly honest. Where he only had sixteen points, four goals, and two hundred and sixteen penalty minutes. Okay, uh, played last year for the Brandon Wheat Kings, two goals in fifty-seven games. That's it, and one hundred and forty penalty minutes. And then this year came back. Actually, he took hockey off all summer. He quit after last year, was working on a farm, very much Saskatchewan. Uh, he's out of Prince Albert. He was working on his friend's farm. And he said that like 20 games into the season, realized he missed hockey and wanted to come back. So actually got himself back into shape. The team signed him 37 games, 100 penalty minutes, one assist. He's wow. a locker room guy. He is a... He, he's what Derek Bugard was in, in for the WHL, right? Except I think Derek Bugard honestly had more skill than this guy. And I'm not saying that to make fun of him or anything. It's just, it's, it's true. That, that is his role there on the ice. But when you hear, despite tested positive for performance enhancing substance, when you hear going into counseling, does that lead you to believe, just with that, without any other info that I'm going to present next year, doesn't that said lead you to believe that it might fall under performance enhancing drugs but it might be something different maybe towards more of the addiction category because of just why why would they say counseling for that it, it, am i am i off like am I, am I am i off my rocker here to my for my self to assume that maybe it's something other than performance enhancing right off the bat based off that article first well i i will say that counseling implies a level of like he needs help on yeah yeah particular things um like if you if you are uh if you're having to go seek counseling like usually that is done for you know um some sort of a substance i don't want to speculate but um that's usually it's addictions what, involved some yeah. sort of you know addiction yeah 
Do you know just how rare it is? Like, I actually looked this up while you were kind of setting the scene. Do you know how rare it is for there to be um, a PED, like a, a suspension? Like, do you in know the how NHL? many there have in the NHL specifically? I you can't even many? remember the last one, dude. I can't. Like, I got it here for you. All right. Uh, Nate Schmidt. Get the was fuck the out last of one. Oh yeah! And, oh yeah! That was, oh, yeah. oh my god! I remember that. This was when he was playing with the Vegas Golden Knights. Yeah, there have only been five since 2013. Wow, five total. That's crazy. Since 2013, and Nate Schmitz actually was because um, there was a trace amount, which is of, usually what happens. Yeah. There's a trace amount, and he, both him and the uh, the Vegas Golden Knights fought the suspension yep. vehemently. Tainted supplement, was, I'm pretty sure, right? Yeah, is, it was too small of an amount, as he said. It was too small of an amount to for give him, him an to enhancement. get any level of benefit from it. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's the last one. That's usually what happens, though, whether it's like it's still in their system or they... They yeah. didn't properly get rid of it, or it was quite frankly just a tainted sub sub substance, and it wasn't his fault, right? That was in 2016, so that was the last one. It was eight years ago. Yeah, well, that's wild. So that verbiage on that CBC article that came out, kind of, I knew that there was going to be more to look up. I knew that there was going to be more to the story. So that's one of the reasons why I was like, okay, that's one of the stories that we'll just leave on the shelf from last week. But I actually found an article that came out a few weeks before that from the Brandon Sun, a local publication there. And one month prior to this suspension, uh, uh, just a, a single piece on him came out, which was really, it was an awesome piece, Seth. And I'll actually share it with you now because it was actually a really good read. They, they painted him and humanized him a lot. They talked about how he realized, you know, I'm I'm not going to be a star in hockey, you know. If I'm going to play, it's this is the role I have to play, and this is this is what I have to bring to the team. So that's where he got a little dejected. Was like, I, I don't even really want to play this anymore. I quit. But you know, missed the boys, missed the locker room. There was uh, a need for his local WHL team that he could, you know, that he, a role anyways that they needed that that he could fill. And I read this though. So here's some other things that make me now think back to okay, maybe he was abusing or maybe he was using i don't know whether it was steroids or an epo substance which epo is mostly used in recovery now it can help injuries recover quicker it's it basically helps your production of red blood cells so that you know you can work out longer your cardio is a little bit better it's not going to get you yoked you know it's not steroids but it, it's especially for hockey like epo is, is where it's at quick recovery and more more red blood cells so that you can continue to hum out there on the ice. Um, the article, for better or for worse now, painted him in the picture of he's redefining the meaning of work ethic, coming back so quickly. He's a chiseled 6-foot, 250-pound frame. He works on a farm part-time while he plays and travels with the team because obviously there's going to be team games where they don't need him, where he's going to be scratched. And he literally will go home and work on the farm at that time. So like this guy's always working. He's he's huge. He's jacked. Um, he was going to retire last year and got back into shape really quickly to be able to play at the WHL level. And dude, I don't care. If, I don't care how big you are. I don't care how enforcer type of game you bring to the ice. If you want to play in the dub, you still have to skate and keep up. And and he can. Um, and he's hoping to now keep playing. And he's working on his skills to stay playing hockey, whether it's in the WHL or maybe a pro contract. So. Funny enough, with this article that came out a year prior, it gave a lot more in a positive light because obviously they didn't know whoever was writing this. This was going to be the case. This was right. This was early. This was in the past, but it did paint that like it did give me some more answers. That like, yeah, maybe this guy did actually use performance enhancing drugs to get back to speed quicker. And you know, thirty seven games in, um, because he did start half the season, finally gets you know, caught with it. Cause I can't imagine they're testing WHL guys every like month, you know, like they are in the NHL. They probably do half of that because, you know, they're still kids and they don't expect it. If anything, they'll like, they know these guys are smoking weed. They probably know they're drinking. You know what I mean? I'm just calling for, for what it is. Like they're, yeah. they're high school kids. They're young adults. I've, I've talked to former WHL players. Like they're normal kids. They're normal teenagers. 
So I, and I don't think that's the reason why the league does it, but they just assume that okay, no one's going to be on this type of stuff. But well, clearly can... there were some alarm bells that sounded because of how crazy he, he was when he came back in as far as being a physical beast. Yeah. And, um, and it's kind of bittersweet because this article paints it at such a cool comeback story, but you know, hopefully, hopefully nothing was abused there. Like any anabolics or anything like that. Cause that's just so tough on the body. And furthermore, I, just, I, I hope he doesn't have to go through this again or feel like he needs to use to be able to get back into it. And hopefully his play does the talking and he stays in shape and doesn't, get dejected and not take time off and feel he has to use, you know, drugs to get back, um, to get back in shape. But just interesting story, given that we don't see this at the pro level much at all in our sports, Seth, especially in North America yet at the junior level in Canada, there's a story with, with the guy. Yeah, it's, it is one of those things. And, you know, it's not to say like from the counseling side, you can get, you can get addicted to performance enhancers. Like we we've heard stories about steroid addiction quite a bit. Oh yeah. Uh, Major league baseball was rampant with it yep. back in the nineties. And so it, it very well could be that. And a lot of times, unfortunately guys that get hurt, go that route to try to speed up the recovery time. Guys get older. They use that to try to delay the aging process. Yeah, try to beat Father Time, who's undefeated. Undefeated. And maybe it's just less about the drug and more about, like, are you okay? Like, you mm. you, you didn't want to play last year. There's probably clearly not... I don't want to say issues or assume anything, but, like, you weren't happy, clearly. But now right. you're falling back in love with the sport, and we don't want you to maybe go down a dark path again or feel like too much pressure with having to work and play hockey. We just want you to play hockey. So like, I'm glad that Brandon and the WHL are allowing him to have that resource because 20 years ago, Seth, hell even longer, that wouldn't be available in, in the dub that this is the tough guy junior league. Like counseling wasn't really a thing where I'm glad now, even with something like this, which I'm not diminishing it compared to, you know, any other thing that, that would happen that would maybe need this, but it's cool that they're, at least giving that to him, giving that resource to him. And uh, yeah, I wish him all the best because you guys all know I love fighting. I love the bruisers. I have a special affinity for them. Um, but they have a they play the game with a different mindset, man. Kind of like goalies play a game with a different mindset. The physical guys who aren't in there every night who have a very singular, singular role to fill. We've seen it, man. From some say blows to the head, which is a part of it. But also just the the stressors of knowing that like I got to go out and get hit, hit, be mean, and fight. Yeah. And you know a lot of guys said that even you know, pro professional fighters they say like if you're not nervous, there's something wrong with you. And the ones who aren't nervous, they're they're the ones who they're the ones who are out to lunch, not us. The normal people are nervous, and you got to imagine that like if that's your job, game in and game out. Or you're waiting to hear, okay, am I in? Because if I, I I have to mentally prepare myself to be that you know, menace, monster, tough guy out there. And, and if sometimes you're like preparing for it and the coach is like, yeah, you're not actually in, I'd imagine like that would just fuck with you, right? Yeah, you'd think that would kind of take a toll. Yeah. Well, it's like, it's like, you know, on the very small end of things for like comparing to layman where it's like, you know, preparing for a meeting at the office or something like that. And then it's not happening. Yeah, you might feel some relief, but it's like, oh, I spent all this time like ramping up for it, preparing. And if that if, if that happens every week where you don't know, well, that's that lack of consistency too, which and everyone, you know, we're we're humans. We need we need consistency. We need uh we need a plan, we need a routine. Enforcers don't have a routine, man. And it's kind of the same with goalies. That's why it's very different than the rest of the players, right? So, anyways, long the short of it. Hope he gets the help he needs. Hope he comes back strong and hopefully he gets another chance to play S, uh, SJHL, WHL, or maybe even a pro hockey team, ECHL, SPHL, something like that uh, down the road. Last two things here, Seth. Evander Kane, he gets uh, fined for slashing. Now, it wasn't the most egregious slash and it wasn't the most egregious fine because, oh boy, five grand. Well, actually... To any player that a fine actually might be worth something at any dollar, it's probably Evander Kane because the guy like has no money. No, I know he's getting paid now, but let's but it's tongue in cheek here. But for any player that a five grand fine is going to hurt more than any of them, it's probably Evander Kane, given that he had to declare bankruptcy and give up all his money before and probably still owes people money at this point. 
little tongue in cheek, but uh, I don't know. So overall, like th- this doesn't punish the players. No, five grand. The whole system, the whole system is designed to do like the bare minimum. Like Torts got fined. Like was it f- fifty? Was it not? It was more than that. Insane. Like, and he got suspended for three games for telling the officials, I'm not leaving the ice. Fuck you. I ain't leaving. Yeah. Like you got guys that go out of their way to try to knock players out of the game and they get like a parking ticket essentially for it. Like it's just the whole system. And then, you know, you get just, I don't know. The whole system needs to be, the whole system needs to be completely and thoroughly reworked because oh, yeah. there's no incentive. There's no incentive to stop the physical play that you are like going out of your way to say that you're trying to get rid of when the Especially only the repercussion shit. is a five thousand dollar fine. Yeah. Like I could I could see there being like arbitration and then arguments going back and forth for maybe like a complicated play where like, yeah, maybe someone got hit in the head, but it wasn't intentional. But if they would have done this different, then maybe it would have been better. Like I can see there being layers and arguments to that, but like we're gonna find you for slashing. It was a bad slash. You can't say it wasn't. Here's five grand. It's like, bro, that does nothing. Like Evander Kane's yeah. still gonna be a rat out there, you know? He's still Probably gonna play pay on the edge. Cash. Yeah. <laughs> Straight like how cash. Many, how many of these guys pay these fines in cash? straight fucking cash homie that should be a sign that it's not enough of a fine yeah there you go uh last thing before i let you go here seth and what i love i love talking to you when there's records that are broken in the national hockey league whether it's on you know the washington capitals which we've seen a few of them as of late we've seen some milestones there john carlson being one of the the recent guys to just play with the capitals and reach a thousand games we got something a little different and we're we're praising your friends in Ottawa. Loved the collaboration with the Locked On Sens boys who came down there. Awesome. Fuck the Leafs. I love you guys. <laughs> um, Brady Kachuk. His season might be over as far as they making the playoffs. They're playing for pride at this point. He has just not only broke a Senators record, but broke a National Hockey League record for the most hits in a single National Hockey League game with 16 against the New Jersey Devils, who've been fucking pests as as of late. I mean, we didn't even talk about the New York Ranger, New Jersey Devil line brawl that happened. But my goodness, did that not did that resemble, you know, John Tortorella and Bob Hartley, 2014 Calgary Flames. Um, But Brady Kachuk, man. He is so good. Now, he's a menace and he takes himself off the ice at times where maybe he shouldn't, but he very much is more of a hybrid of of his brother and his dad than than Matthew being closer to Keith. Matthew's kind of his own thing. Like Matthew's more like Brad Marchand than anything, whereas Brady Kachuk is more like Keith, but with that offense that that Matthew has. And Matthew Kachuk said it. He's like, my brother is probably going to be better than me. My brother could beat me up in a fight. Like, my brother is a monster. And he was saying that when, when Brady was 16, right? Um, in 76 games this year, 34 goals. Third time he's reached a 30-goal mark in the National Hockey League. Uh, 68 points and 128 penalty minutes. Now, they're going to miss the playoffs again. But last year, Seth, 35 goals. 83 points and 126 penalty minutes. I mean, it, this guy is all business and he backs it up scoring as well. He only had one year Boston University. See you later. Didn't need to come back because my goodness, has he just been a wrecking ball in the National Hockey League. Well, and I think the hit numbers are even more impressive. He's got 270 hits on the season. Dude, third for hits in the entire league. And that's not even like that's not even his personal best. Like he had a 303 hit season in 71 games as a 20 year old. Dude, was that his second year or his first year? Was that 1920? That was his second year. 1920, yeah. And he had a he had a respectable 21 goals and 106 pims that year as well. Unbelievable. Like I I've been talking because I tweeted out and it it got a lot of traction. Um the fact that the wild have the smallest and shortest roster in the NHL. And then people are like, well, what do you do about that? I was like, you got to find yourself 
a Brady Kachuk. You got to just go get one that can do all of it. He can score you the goals and he will punch anybody in the mouth that moves. Like that's, yeah. that's what you like. That's, it's not a problem that you can solve by simply saying, okay, we're going to go find the size. Our skill guys are going to be short. Like you got to get those unicorns that can do both. Which is Brady easier said do than done. Let's let's be honest. It's easier yeah. said than done. But those guys are available in the draft. And mm -hmm. sometimes you're going to swing and miss. Like, oh, I forget his name off the top of my head. Oh, it started with a G, I think. Oh, he's just been bouncing around the AHL now. This is... I'll find it before we end here. But the Canucks took a chance on a second round pick a few years ago. And he, he got like 80 some points in his final OHL year. Before then was just kind of like a 40 or some point guy. Um... I'm looking this up on the fly here, but he was a bruiser. Like it was like, okay, if he popped offensively, he could be that Brady Kachuk style player. Unfortunately, he never did. And the Canucks also took a chance on trading for Zach Cassian, who back in the day was kind of like that as well. And they gave up, gave up on Cody Hodgson. Which, by the way, shout out to Cody Hodgson. Faced a lot of mental and health issues, coached for a bit, and is actually back playing pro hockey now. After retiring, which is which is really cool, we'll dive into that story on a summer episode because you know we got some other things to talk about right now. But as I continue to rag the puck here, where was it? Where was it? Do, 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 do. Uh, Jonah Gadjevich, fifty fifth overall out of Owen Sound. Okay, he's with the Florida Panthers. He's actually playing games with them too. Actually, only four points in thirty seven games, but he had a seventy four point season in the OHL. And then after he kind of regressed 48 point season in 42 games, never really popped in the AHL. So Vancouver kind of moved on from him. He played a few years with the San Jose sharks, but that was a guy that, okay, like, yeah, it's high to spend a second round on him, but like he maybe could have become that. Right. And, uh, yeah, you said those are guys where sometimes you have to take a chance on whether in free agency or in the draft, because if they pop and they can be, I'm not going to say everyone's going to be like Brady Kachuk would be 80, point guy and a bruiser but if you can get a 40 to 50 point guy some like felino but more skilled yeah you're you're that's, laughing you're laughing that's, that's exactly it like like his some, brother honestly that that's who you want somebody that can play you want your nick top felino. Six. yeah you want nick felino <laughs> that's a good that's a good um, american example <laughs> well, i guess brady kachuk's american too he just plays in canada but anyways um that's all i got here today seth uh some some fun NHL stories, to be honest, to be able to bring something a little different. Because I don't think anyone's talking about this performance-enhancing situation in the dub. I don't think anyone has talked about this Flyers goalie. And I know MNCAA covers a lot of college kids. They probably mentioned a few of these names. But for you and I, who are, you know, me, junior hockey-focused and wild little Canucks, I know you're just plugged into the wild. So I figured, uh, hey, you and I would both get a kick out of going through some of these guys and being like, okay, maybe we'll start... Well, at least we'll now know who some of these guys are and be like, oh, that's, uh, that's one of the guys that was signed at the end of <laughs> last season. Maybe the Wild should start looking at some of these guys as well. Type of guys, it, anyways. It's, it's getting to that time. And, I mean, thankfully for the Wild, a lot, of, uh, a lot of the movement that they've had recently has been just signing all of their prospects to entry-level contracts with the hope that a few more are coming. So yeah, the roster's pretty full. And the hope is that some of these guys will get a better opportunity next year to make the squad and to make an impact. If they do, we're cooking. Maybe we we're can cooking. get uh, maybe we can get some more consistency from line two. I did Seth not anticipate I, that rhyming, but yeah. Well, I was going to say we've already turned the page on the season already for the off season, ready for these fun hockey stories, ready for training camp. I know a lot of the fan base they're they're still upset, rightfully so, but. At least, you know, lick the fingers and grab the corner of the page and start start the movement because the season's going to be done soon. We're going to be in playoff mode. And at that point, like, we don't want to hear you bitching anymore. You got to turn the page and focus on the future, focus on the next step. And Seth and I will be here to give you all of our thoughts, uh, all of any info that we hear and continue to interact with you guys as well. So... As always, Seth, thanks for jumping on. What do you got coming up this week on Locked on Wild? We have a lot of road games this week. Tuesday, Friday, and Saturday on the West Coast. Busy so week. We have you covered um, with live postcasts after all the games. 
Um, we're going to talk to uh, my good friend Jesse Pierce this week. Hey, um, tell her I liked her suit over the on Saturday. She didn't. She didn't see me because she was hobnobbing with people. I get it. I didn't want to butt in, but I was just like, "Damn, what a suit! <laughs> <laughs> it was pink. It was loud, and it was yeah. in charge. It basically looked like this, ladies and gentlemen, who are watching on YouTube." But I was like, "Damn, Jesse, that's your color." <laughs> Jesse is the best. So oh, we'll we uh, we'll, ca we'll catch up with her and. I'm trying to get more into guest mode now as we get close to the off season. And mostly, you know how my mind operates, Isha. I'm working on plans for way down the road, starting to get those gears turning for the off season, stuff to keep it fresh, stuff to keep it moving because the off season is going to start a little earlier for the wild this year. And so we just got to make sure that the content is ready to rock once the official mathematical elimination has hit. Absolutely. Hey, this is the best part of my week, man. Can't wait to jump on Locked On later this week. As always, thank you so much for your time, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. It's always my favorite part of the week, hanging out with Seth, either bringing him, bringing him on the soda pod or me jumping on Locked On Wild. It's always a vibe, as we say now. So big shout out to Seth, as always, for giving us his time here on Monday. And I mean, you guys seem to love this collaboration that we're doing. So thank you all for supporting us as well. Last but not least, I want to give a shout out to our friends at Better Edge, ladies and gentlemen. Better Edge is a legal sports betting option in this great state of Minnesota. Yes, I still said great state, even though they don't allow sports betting yet. But the way that you can enjoy sports betting and get in on all the action is through Better Edge. And right now, if you go to betteredge.com slash SOTA pod, you can get a $20 sign up bonus. That's right, $20 to play around with, free money to fall in love with an amazing sports betting app. Psh, sign me up, ladies and gentlemen. I've already signed up, but you guys can sign up as well. Again, betteredge.com slash SOTA pod. We do various events also through the app. We had a bracket for the NCAA finals or tournament i should say and we also do minnesota wild game day pickums as well five dollar entry winner take all and you get to choose seven out of ten points those points include money line player point totals etc more competitions to come as well uh go follow soda pod on better edge for con contest notifications again a free platform with legal betting in the state of minnesota and 44 other states as well. Go to betteredge.com slash soda pod. You might as well use that $20 sign up. Again, local company, great people, proud supporter of the soda pod. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. That is the show. Again, big shout out to all, all of our partners. Big shout out to you, the listeners, everybody who watches us on YouTube, everybody who listens to us on the podcast. Hit us up with a five-star review on the audio side of things. If you're on YouTube, don't forget to like the video and comment. That's really all we ask. And if you, like, we want to know how you like the episode. We want to include you in the conversation. And if you haven't already subscribed to our channel on YouTube, go check out Locked on Wild as well as they do live streams, premiere of their podcast episodes. All their podcast episodes are there as well. Clips and watch parties. I saw a bunch of you in, in Seth's chat on Sunday and on Saturday. Saturday for the post-game show and Sunday for his live stream. So go check that out as they're doing more and more of them there. And it's an honor to be able to work with Seth on Locked on Wild as well. And for everyone who is listening to our podcast, both Seth's and all of them that we have on the Soda Pod audio side or video side, again, thousand times thank you. You guys are amazing. We appreciate every single one of you. With that being said, that's it for the show this week. Signing off, signing off I'm Isha. Draw me alongside Seth Topo. This has been the Soda Pod presented by Better Edge, 7th Avenue Pizza, Northland Vodka, and Waggle Golf. Don't fear, just drink some beer and stay wild. <laughs>